first music I remember in my life hearing. Uh, so that's the Swiss side of me there. Um, but it's just really great to be able to sit down and, and, and play something without turning it on. It makes music. I get really nervous around cameras. That's not my thing. Don't. Writing? All right. Yeah, so Show Mount first pass, Dead Eye God first pass, mm -hmm. Lumberjack first pass. Localization QA starts. Live instrument recording. Yeah, VO, playtesting, and testing. This is the big one. Are you putting it in all caps? <laughs> of course. <laughs> there it is. Oh, man. Um, do you want to talk about schedule stuff before we sure. get to the meeting? Sure. Very exciting stuff. Greg's got exciting schedule stuff to talk about. Okay, well, today is uh, end of a sprint, right? So we should talk about uh, this in light of that. But uh, yeah, Matt and Sue and I have been working on uh, schedule stuff for the project for a while now. So we have a lot of data that I guess we can talk through. Um, but I guess. First, we should probably just walk through how all this stuff happened um, to explain where we came from. And the thought is, is that we potentially have, scope-wise, uh, enough content for a game to ship sooner rather than later. January for part one and April for part two. That as long as it's definitely just part one and you're definitely going to get part two. Yeah. And it's not just a... Because um, I hated the end of Empire. Like when I was a kid and it ended that way, I was like, what the fuck? So that's how we got to this. So this is kind of where uh, that is for part one right now, and then there's also part two down here. Um, but it kind of gives you a good snapshot as far as what the next year would look like to hit that January date. I and mean, even this is pretty scary when you look at just two weeks total for Dead Eye God Pyramid, like us all together working on that and banging that whole room out, the interior and the exterior in two weeks, right? Yeah. Has that been proven to work by January or April? Yeah, I mean, as, as far as, like, we're as accurate as we it. can get, like, we're you, wait, running did, You did already, or? We, were, we quantified that. Okay. Yeah. yeah, we went through and, like, assigned what each of those scenes, how complex they are compared to an average scene, which we called the galley, and ran the numbers on all of it. And that's how we figured out like how many scenes and of what type we can get. And so there's a little bit of fudging there. Like if you have scenes yeah. that are super complex, that's gonna count as more than right. something that's a hallway. And um, it also shows the consequences if we don't get Dead Eye Dodd done in two weeks. You see there's no other room for it to go into except for to push, yeah. push all the other dates out, which would be a huge problem because the, the deadline in January is a revenue-based deadline basically that Justin says he needs that revenue in January or? Uh, the reason the game must be done in January is because that's at the time we run out of funds for that game. We're taking all the funds the studio makes and putting it into Broken Age, like all of them. So, um, but it becomes in January, this comes this point in time where floating that big of a team um, on an ongoing basis just can't be done out of our own royalties and our own profits for the studio. Like it breaks at that time, so yeah, we just we have to ship something and have to start making some money off that project. It's a little surprising that we have four weeks for spaceship beta, mm -hmm. given how far we've taken it. Yeah, and I, I think so too. It's weird when you look at that stuff, but the reasons are like if you look at this list, um, the amount of scenes in the spaceship are 
pretty much equal to the amount of scenes in the entire girls' world. Uh, and you know there is uh, animation. I mean, you got to do all the final animation. All the animation. Yeah, a lot of cutscenes. And the thing about that is that um, this because it's so tight and uncomfortable, and there's not a big space for like. There's some playtest feedback in here, but there's not like a, like a month of just playtest feedback or two, which is what we'd really like. Mm -hmm. So I think we're always going to have to be looking at places where we're finishing some things early. And if that four weeks sounds like a lot of time, that maybe hopefully means that the gameplay programmers could get ahead to create that buffer where we actually do have like a month of playtest feedback. That yeah. would be awesome. And um, the schedule's done, and I want it to be a little more like a home run than it is because it's kind of like, yeah, it looks on paper like we can do it, but there's not a lot of wiggle room. Normally you want a lot of uh, buffer time because things always do go wrong or take longer than you thought. So um, I think we just have a little more work to do on it to make sure we have enough buffer room in it. Or we have to go along every time we get something done, try and get it done a little early, but that's always kind of like a dream. Like every project you want to do that, like, oh, let's just get everything done a little bit early and then we'll build up a buffer time, but I haven't ever seen that really happen. Do we have other thoughts? Questions. This thing's all live, so it's really easy to plug numbers in and change them around and see where it goes. But yeah, <laughs> I think the the um, doing early access for the game impacts um, Oliver the most because um, his stuff has to be done. His system work has to be done in January. And he's got to have a shippable product in January, which means all the there's a lot of like stuff that you, you know you tend to push off to the end of a project just to kind of like maybe it's optimization or just wrapping things up to make sure they they're airtight you know that all has to happen a lot earlier and so that's probably hardest on him cool yeah i mean i guess the only thing is just uh just no going into starting on monday we're spending three months on sugar bunning and then three two weeks three. on three months. Oh, man, three months god i wish uh no three weeks on sugar bunning and then moving on so i mean you can see why Okay, I'm, I wrote a thing explaining the early access stuff to the backers, and we're gonna do an update on Monday. That is a full-on update with the episode on Monday. No. No, the episode will be Tuesday. I think you were just gonna post in the forums, like. Uh... So the when is so is Chris writing an update on Tuesday, and that's the one that's attached to the episode. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, in Reds this week, we're having episode ten go out live, which is the one where we're talking about our shipping plan. And so that could be very active, a very active week for the um, for the backers. <laughs> active, just how much they love the new plan. Talking about that is what I mean. And then um, is it going today? So tomorrow. tomorrow. Okay, here's my post. Long post. I like the first thing. Sounds great. And so the way for January begins. Oh, pleasant fellow. And what would be neat? The next one was just mean and horrible. Sounds okay to me, Chief. See, like when they're talking to me, people were pretty polite. Yeah, see, all these people are really positive about it. I don't want to scroll down any farther in case someone says something mean. But let's see how, how long is this thread. This is like three pages now? Four, five! We announced the new plan for releasing the game on our forums, and our backers were pretty great about it. I mean, they want to talk about it. They were, you know, want to make sure it was going to be a good thing. And I think um, we had a pretty good reaction to it, which is good, because I would like to have this be locked and settled and then just move on to working on the game and not worrying about this. But um, some press people took that out of our backer forums and put it up. Some of them put the entire post up, um, which was actually better than what others did, which was take a couple of words here and there, and then put the headline as like, Kickstarter out of money! You know, like implying that the whole thing's crashing and burning. Just eight news sources right now. Looks like it's got Escapist. Double Fine wasn't being greedy with second Kickstarter. Okay. I mean, there's a couple people that are just reacting like, oh crap, there goes, there goes Kickstarter. It's all a sham to begin with. And other people are like, <laughs> come on, right? Um, there just, there's this whole crowd of people who are dying for anti-Kickstarter Kickstarter news. I don't know why that is, but some people are just like, oh, I hate this Kickstarter thing. I can't wait for someone to just totally fuck it up. That's frustrating, but um, what are you gonna do? It's just to make the game awesome, get it out there, and then track them all down individually and kill them. <laughs> There's, there's some cynicism out there. I mean, there's skepticism, and that somewhat is to be expected, right? Because there hasn't been a big Kickstarter project yet that's actually delivered. So, I mean, I, I can't blame too many people for being skeptical. Um, I think this all, you know, in the fullness of time, will play itself out. So when people see the end product, it will, you know, people will forget about this. But right now, there's, yeah, there's a bit of a shitstorm.
Yeah, do I look tired? Are you up on that? <laughs> Longer than I should have been. Yeah. You know, remember how uh, after the trailer we talked about how I looked at all those forums and everything was super positive? It's definitely not the case last night. So, uh, yeah, I spent a, time, a lot of time reading all of those comments and trying to see what were actual points we should think about and what is just kind of misinformed. And, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think it's our backers have been great about coming to our support and clarifying when people are giving kind of the wrong information and things like that. Um, yeah. We were basically all caught off guard with um, it leaking and then going negative so fast. Because it's like, because the more I look at it, the more you're like, okay, we're taking, we're making a bigger game than we kickstarted. We are delivering it later, but we're paying with our own money for it and then doing this easy early access to fund the rest of it. It's, um, and then to have that framed as a total scam and a ripoff by us, just is kind of mind boggling. Like, so basically the press, um, leaked our stuff, which is a violation of our terms of use. Because this is the thing, when you're a journalist, like I've been a journalist and I, the, like, I feel it gives me a decent perspective on this stuff because as soon as one person goes live with it, every single other person who publishes it is not violating shit. In fact, they're almost yeah. derelict in their duties yeah. for just ignoring it because as far as, their, from their perspective, it's public information that's already out there. So you're being actually just kind of a weird, like, lackey to the, some developer if you're just saying, well, they wanted me to not do it. Like, that that's was not... the case. Like once, it, once one person broke it, then yeah. now I mean, I it's could, public. I don't like Looking back on it, we could have done a lot of things different, but I don't want to learn the lesson. The most obvious lesson that you could learn from that is that you should be less transparent. Like, okay, we were just so open and transparent and all that that we could have probably like, we could have probably massaged that message better and hid a lot of stuff, but I don't know if that's really the lesson I want to learn from that. You know what I mean? Like if we had hid the whole thing and just been like, uh, you know, every three months push the launch, the launch date out three months, like most companies do with games, so they just slip it out. And then been, hey, by the way, I know it's not coming out till May, but here's an early access thing in January, and it's a great thing. Everyone been, wow, that's great. Um, so being more secretive could have protected us from that, from that bad public response. But that goes against everything that we're trying to do with the project was to be completely open and show everybody everything. Part of it's also, this was just like a learning experience for us in a way, I think that if even if we do have another thing that is this significant that we're putting out there, I think we would just, knowing this was gonna happen, probably could have done it a little smarter. At the time, I don't know how we would have necessarily had that foresight, like to the degree would, would have been necessary, but I think we just need to be more careful. But now it's out there and whatever, you know, the press makes of it or whatever weird comments we get from people who weren't backers, that's over. Well, it might go on tonight and tomorrow. But <laughs> um, we, production-wise, have moved past that and are just now focusing on the game. Oh, oh the frame change. Oh. Yep. Hello. Oh, man, look at that. It's like the whole town. Oh, man. The whole town looks like it's got sugar, like little sugar canisters. That's awesome. Right now, we're kind of like in the middle of switching from, I mean, I'm sure you've heard from the spaceship to the Vela's like neighborhood and Baker Town and all that stuff. Yeah, this is the first shot that they'll see. And so what we're doing is just layouts right now. We're just basically getting the staging with the art backgrounds and the characters in, and we're doing what we call rough blocking. So in the playthroughs, we can all watch it with, with Tim and everybody and just say, okay, does that work? Does this work with the game? Um, it's pretty important, I guess, that we figure out where everyone's standing. Is this like the like final resting place for everyone, do you think, where we want them? The, the witch is facing the wrong way. She should be facing towards the cake, but it, we needed a, enough space for you to build a walk around without accidentally clicking on someone. And that was, that was where we wound up. He could also be shoved facing left over here more. Because this thing, this is a kind of an unnecessary thing. We just and, paint that out. And it looks so prominent that you kind of want to play with yeah, it, but yeah. you could use that shelf space too if mm -hmm. he was like closer to it or something, so you wouldn't be tempted to walk, like you'd be tempted to walk this way around him instead of this mm -hmm. way. We could always put like little photos of, um, maybe there's like little black and white photos of, of him as a young warrior or something, like he's staring at like his past as a, you know, or whatever, oh, if you man. want to put some little getting sadder, subtle sadder. stuff there. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, we try to put as much in as we can because we're so limited on time. So 
we know a lot of this stuff is going to change once we get final dialogue because we don't have the, the final actors. We don't have those recordings and that can change a lot of the timing. Famous people, like real actors, they all read dialogue a lot slower than our scratch dialogue. Our scratch dialogue is when we go in and do recordings and we all sort of act out the characters. Bring me a star chart and the fabric of time and space shall be knit to serve your passage. <laughs> the fuck? I came in this morning and Ray was like, he said we need some more mom voice. And I'm like, oh, all right, I guess that's me. I actually, I really like, I like how you did the mom. Well, I'm reading it just as me, so. And since I am a mom, I guess that's okay. You got okay. good mom voice. Mm -hmm. Is there anybody else on this ship? So you've never seen a strange wolf around? Well done. All right. Uh, so we would like to try to get as much as we could into these scenes without having to change everything entirely once we get that final dialogue. So we're kind of doing a lot of stuff that you would do sequentially all at once. They're trying not to do too much. You can tell some of them are animating more than they should there because they just wanted to make a nice scene. And soon we're going to have final dialogue for all that, so we'll be able to polish that up like we couldn't before. Should we just start listening to stuff? Yeah, dude. We can just go down the list. Let's do it. Chris and I started working together at LucasArts in the 90s. Like, she started nice there. 90s. When did, what was your first job title at LucasArts? Uh, I was the product support supervisor. Yeah, so she was in Prod Sup. Yeah. And then, um, but the first thing you did sound on from me is Full Throttle, right? Uh, or Day of the Tentacle. No, no you were in, for Day of the Tentacle. You were in the Day of the Tentacle. We said dirty things to Mark Hamill in his headphones, and that's true. We learned a lot. And we, we learned a lot. lot. Since then. We grew up a lot since then. <laughs> super professional, mature now. Uh, okay, let's listen to some more voices. We, I had a, list, a meeting with Chris where I actually listened to the first auditions. We listened to a whole bunch of auditions, and um, a few of them were good, but it's just the start. We're going to listen to a whole lot more auditions. We have a bunch of characters to cast. You came because you are done with children's games. My name is Merrick, and what I'm about to show you is no game. Pretty good, but I think I like the other guy. David Kaufman, Merrick. Whoa. You came because you are done with children's games. My name is Merrick, and what I'm about to show you is no game. While you've been drifting through the universe, eating ice cream and playing with trains, war has been raging across the galaxy. Between the forces that every war is between. Between the powerful and the weak. The tyrants and the innocent. Does it even matter? There will always be war. We did not start it, and we cannot stop it. But what we can do is protect the weak and rescue the helpless. Whoa. That guy's pretty awesome. He's higher pitch than I imagined him for him, but I love how he read it. Oh, we had our first casting session. Chris was on Skype, and I was listening to all the auditions. Um, they were good. There were a couple characters where I felt like that's exactly right. We could use that voice. And for a lot of them, and the main ones, I think it's gonna be a longer process where we just take this first listen, and then Chris and I have something that we can talk to together. Like, where is this, instead of just reaching out in the dark, we're like, okay, now we've heard a voice. Is it older, younger than this? Is it meaner or nicer than this? You know, we can talk about all the different ways we want to use that as a, as a, a landmark to now navigate to the actual voice that we want. Is that a good metaphor? Okay. Mm we have a company meeting at 2 o'clock also. Oh. Oh, God. What do you think is the most important thing to listen to? I think the most important things to listen to are Shay and Vela. Vela. Okay, let's listen yeah. to some Vela's. Need help uh, cleaning up? Oh, uh -huh. There's something wrong with that one. I don't know what it is. Hi. Uh, need help uh, cleaning up? Uh, not bad. Hold on. I think it's time we start fighting that monster. It sounds really young to me. It sounds like her little sister, but I don't know. I'm trying to think of what 14-year-old girls sound like. 
Um, there's a sample of a 15 year old girl and her audition is bitchy and I don't like it, but it just gives you an idea of what a 15 year old girl sounds like. What you got? Let me see that. <laughs> nah, I don't really need it that bad. Acting is kind of a problem. But... Hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Oh, no. I hate to make you sad. Do you want to hear all the B-list ones that didn't get um, put up? Oh, no. I know. I was just saying, um, you know, I mean, listen to the all. We have tons of auditions. I know. I mean, is there anything really unique in there? I guess I was looking for something that was kind of special, unique in some um, way. Special, like... Super likable. So they're all good. Pardon? I mean, they're all good. They're all in the right, correct range, I think, in age, for the most part, except for that one that sounded really young. Um, I guess I was looking but, for one with, like, a personality that would leap out at me. But I think it just takes time. I think, it's, I think I have to just listen to them a whole bunch of times. Yeah, but I don't want you to be, like, beat into sub beaten into submission, like, and reconcile yourself to something less than what you truly want. When would you I know? ever do that? When would I ever let that happen? Anyway, that's how it goes. You get the first listen, and now Chris and I whoa, whoa, don't use the part where I spit all over my Rubik's cubes. Um, yeah, now she has a little clearer idea of what I think of each character. Now that we have something to compare it to, and then we're still also pursuing some like friends, friends and famous people for the game. We'll see where that goes. I don't want to say anything because if it doesn't happen, we'll just feel stupid. Possible, one might say, celebrity cameos in the game. Me, just me. No, um, actual bona fide celebrities. Characters are people that we've used, actors that we've used. Uh, my hope is to use actually a lot of people that we have used before, just in fun small parts, like Richard Horowitz and Nikki Rapp and uh, um, Contact Mr. Mr. Black, see if yeah. he was available. He, he offered to do that like before. Oh, he did? He said he'd be the hipster lumberjack. Love to work. <laughs> <laughs> that would be so awesome. Are you working on this? Awesome. Cool. This is Betty. Hey. Uh, yeah, last week I got some of the UI stuff cut up and integrated, and I also um, got most of the way through doing the kind of like, they're not implementing the game yet, but the white box for all of Shell Mound. My goal is to get all those all in the game and hooked up by the end of the week. This is really kind of our white box. Now we do have some basic layering set up here, and I did some basic camera work, but this shows the basic layout of the scene, with the key elements in place. So these are, you know, just quick black and white drawings, but um, <clears throat> they, some of them, like this, without, without going into too much detail, this particular scene has a very strange layout in some ways because you have to see this sort of distant view of Shell Mound because it sets up something that happens later. So it really wasn't that any of these are the final shapes or languages or anything, or even really the final shot. It was as much to make sure that all those elements had a place and could work together in a single screen composition. So you kind of have to work at a certain level of detail just to be able to figure that out and to communicate that to Bagel. My goal is to get all those all in the game and hooked up by the end of the week. It would be close to being almost all white boxed. Camden, World uh, of Sound. Last week, uh, it was mostly filling out Spaceship, um, and there's still a few glitches, timing stuff that I have to work on and kind of tighten up. How's the sound effect process been coming together? Are you doing, I mean, I saw you do Foley stuff before. Yeah. Uh, it's a super high-tech spaceship, but at the same time, like, I kind of think it'd be kind of fun to like have stuff kind of squeaky and you can hear the wheels and the joints working and things like that. So uh, I'm trying to get some elements with Laura's key card. Ready? Yep. Great. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. And I'm starting to do some things with uh, like phase and uh, modulation. I'm just kind of getting like this almost like alien machinery sound. Uh, but I was also noticing some of its properties I could do for like um, some of the robots. Like almost chattering. Cool. Rusty. Um, beginning of the week was mostly some prop stuff for the girl's house, and then it's up to. On the mock chather once you get the textures done. So, Adrian was actually involved with doing the character modeling and the rigging, but he went off to another project to help out. <laughs> 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 
It was supposed to be a shot of you hard at work on another project. So <laughs> yeah. That's right, that's how we're playing. Uh, the backers are gonna love that. <laughs> but since they had a vacancy to fill because Adrian left, I'm the next guy up, so yeah. Yeah, so some of the stuff I'm doing is yeah. just like going back through old files. Okay. Like a lot of this stuff was made for the actual yeah. teaser trailer and um, Adrian's got a lot of rigging things that he did for us that in the, in the meantime that some of these older rigs need to get updated with. So um, like this girl, this is the girl in the cake that you probably saw in the trailer. Uh, I'm adding actually the lower half of her body so that when she gets pulled out, you know, she actually has a body that comes with it. So he was also done pretty early on in the project, so we kind of revamped him and revamped his skeleton. So he's got some, some uh, other controls now that you can kind of do a little parallax so that if he's trying to turn, this part can, you know, look like it's going behind him a little bit. He's got the ability to open his jaw and stuff now. Jesse, whoa. Ah! That's scary. <laughs> I've actually been able to write now, so I wrote the Maiden's Feast stuff, as you saw, and that's been delivered, and Melina's putting that in the database right now. And then the next thing we're gonna be working on, I think, is Shell Mount, we decided. I think we're gonna plunge ahead with the okay. new stuff just to make sure no one's blocked by dialogue ever again. Hopefully I get the dialogue done in the next month or two, all of it done, and then it'll just be me reviewing and redesigning and rewriting stuff. Playtesting. Holy um, crap. I know. I was, uh, I was playing Day of the Tentacle and I was playing some of the other old games and I just noticed that on a lot of those games there's multiple writers. Mm. Is there a way to bring on a junior writer that could help? I mean, I'm, I'm always open to that. We did that on Psychonauts. Um, it's just always been... It's really been hard to find people that um, do it exactly, exactly right. I mean, and it's also it's kind of time-consuming to read a bunch of writing samples. and Yeah. And, um, there's a possibility, like if some rock star writer just walked in the door mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and was ready to go, I would totally be open to that. And this is where you cut to some rock star writer walking <laughs> in the door. <laughs> like someone actually looks like a rock star, but he's got a pen and paper. <laughs> <laughs> would you rather have help there or in design? Well, design, I can always get help by just having brainstorming sessions with people and having people you know, to talk to and to give ideas. Everybody's got like a lot of ideas to, to offer. Um, we had um, the axe, which I presume he could just hand you. Um, and he makes a stool, which you could make here. He's, there's a bathroom where you get the stool. Uh, and um, that'll be the only part of this meeting that Paul puts on the next episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, what, how are you feeling? I think what I want to do is put all those cuts in and really just do... Um, a puzzle graph where I'm looking at all the puzzles that are in the game and counting them and see how many we have and how that compares to past games and kind of hours of gameplay because I just don't want to have a, a game that's like you know three hours long I just want to make sure that we're still see that's a funny to me because it me. seems like you're always complaining about long games and it seems like what? everyone in the office enjoys short experiences well they're short and then there's like holy crap I can't believe they took two years to make this game yeah but and I mean the wide the longer you go the just like more dilute it gets right and just in general, it seems like favoring a well-polished core experience over I'm a longer... I'm not talking about those kind of things. I'm not talking about diluting it. I'm saying, like, um, like Lee But it's I, what we're doing, like, right? Because, like, no, I'm not, hold there's on. only a certain amount Shh. of... Just <laughs> <laughs> let me get this out. I like, like, Lee and I were talking, like, it's stacking. Like we were talking about stacking. The content of stacking is not low. It's like it's tons of density and tons of characters and stuff like that. And we used to talk about ways of, like, trying to extend... Um, like there's content people just miss when they go through it yeah. that possibly um, mechanically we could have brought more into the critical path of the game, right? And mm -hmm. it'll, it'll always be the, no matter what we do when we ship, there'll be a big call like it's too short because people always complain about, yeah. especially adventure games being too short because they rush through them. Because yeah. some people want to rush through them and then they're like, ah, oh, it's too short. Yeah. So, I do think it's a recent we, phenomenon though, people arguing the other way. We're not going to be able to make this game too long. There's nothing we can do to make this game feel too long or be too long because you just cannot extend that content that's handmade mm -hmm. in that way. We have no systems that we can accidentally turn the screws on and just all of a sudden make it. Yeah, I guess I just don't see it as an issue if it feels short. I do, but. I do. I think there's a certain value proposition. A certain, like, ripped off feeling if it's not um, 
at, at, at a you know, there's, there's mm -hmm. a, definitely a minimum. We only have so much money to spend and so much time on this game, so like, the more content we put in, the less time we have to polish it. So it's a delicate balance. But I think he's just, he just doesn't want us to like finish and we do a full playtest of the game and it's like two hours long and it just feels empty. But like, there's no way that's gonna happen. Like I'm, I'm pretty sure it's gonna be like eight, 10 hours, just based on what, we, what we've seen. Yeah, and I think that Full Throttle is the one specifically people always call out to him. And I think it is because it is a more like linear narrative kind of, like I don't feel like I got stuck a ton in Full Throttle, and I don't think anyone who would play it now would say it's short. We are making an eight, 10 hour game, maybe, who knows, but like either way, we're making an hour of music, so it's not gonna fill the whole game. So does that mean we have parts that don't have music that rely on ambience? Um, does that mean we uh, write extra music like we did with Cloud Colony, but it seems like there's conflicting opinions <clears throat> between people on the team. Between Brian and Peter? Or? Yeah. It's just that things like, we have the Cloud Colony, for example, where we made changes. Right. So like, you know, a month goes by, we had to keep moving, but yeah. you know, we couldn't get feedback from you. So there's inefficiencies there, so uh, I think- but, we, but, I, see, but I didn't know there was feedback to give. Um, I, I, think we, I do think we need to revisit the Cloud Colony stuff because um, quite honestly, the, the new version doesn't work for me. It feels too fast. It doesn't feel drifty and floaty anymore. And, um, you know, I ran it by Tim and he felt the same way. You have to understand where I'm coming from. I'm trying to meet deadlines to make sure that we have certain things, certain momentum. So the creative feedback is nothing personal. We're not trying to inject our own kind of thing. But Brian, we, listen, yeah. I understand totally. You yeah. are just trying to solve a problem. Yes, that's exactly right. Responsibility for not checking the game sooner, it'll never happen again. Well, uh, clearly the workflow uh, needs better communication from here on out between the four of us. Yeah, totally. Yep. Uh, Pete is contracted only for a certain amount of music and uh, we have to find a way to stretch it out because the game's gonna need a lot more time than that. You know, how do you cover how do you cover all the ground that you need to cover? I mean, that's really that's really what's behind this question, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. And so, Peter, I was talking to Brian about this, and I think it is actually a lot. Most important question. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's actually really similar to what we've been facing with the art team, because mm -hmm. uh, you know when we started out on this game, the whole idea was it was going to be a really tiny adventure game, and Bagel was going to draw every character in every environment in the game. Right. And obviously, it's just a much larger game now to where he can't do all of the art. So we've had to expand our art team and figure out how to make that work and how to make the game feel like it all looks like what Bagel would do even though there's been a lot of hands touching it. It's gonna be a matter of getting pieces from you that essentially feel like concepts for this is what Cloud Colony music sounds like and this is everywhere it goes. And then we let Brian and Camden run with it a bit and just keep throwing stuff over to you to see if you like the direction that they're kind of expanding things. I mean, I, mean, I actually think it's gonna be a, an interesting problem to solve to, to, um, to, uh, to uh, you know, work with you guys to make this score bigger. Uh, yeah, so, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm not, I'm, I'm not seeing this as a, uh, you know, I, I just see it as, as, as what we're dealing with and, and, and something that has interesting, you know, an interesting challenge Back in Boston, uh, after I got out of, out of college, one of my one of my housemates in Boston was Michael Land, and we worked together at, um, and he later became the sound director at Lucas. I saved up some money and and quit my job at Lexicon and drove out west. And the idea was to, um, you know, start a band. Well, by the time I got here, <laughs> he had gotten his job at Lucas Arts and said, "Oh, you know, you got to check this out." I got involved in that and um, first as a consultant, and then uh, and then you know I joined the sound department and uh, he definitely helped get me started in game music so I'm I'm very grateful to him my biggest tool for really starting is this handheld thing here I just walk around and hum stuff into it da, 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 da. if I do any more we'll have to pay John Williams yeah see I know how to operate this thing 
Oh, gee, that's a, that's a pretty catchy tune. Maybe I should maybe I should use that one. So I would hum into this machine, then come back to it and see if I still like the melody. I'm a big melody guy. You really need to go home whistling something. If the person who listens to it, if they're a musician or not, they're gonna sit there and hum it later. For Psychonauts, I used to send Tim, um, you know, little MP3 files of, you know, hey, here's what I'm working on, Tim, you know. And, oh, yeah, uh, great. Um, uh, can you <laughs> I think I'll have to hear it more in context. So then the next stage would be to actually sort of work it out the piano and uh, notate it. Broken Age is a really interesting one, actually. I think it's one of the hardest scores I've ever done because in something like Grim Fandango, there are, there are sort of recognizable worlds with, with sort of little plums of, you know, this is sort of Central American city with a noir, an art deco um, vibe to it. This is a dock like in the Maltese Falcon. There are real specific cultural references in, 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 in that in Psychonauts. There are really specific cultural references. And if there weren't, I stuck them in there. Um, but Broken Age is, is it's a fable about a very, a, a completely imaginary world. The, the village, the, the Mariloft, the spaceship, they're these very, um, they're worlds into themselves, and so I'm really trying to find sounds that are also sounds into themselves. My initial feeling was that the town needed to have this sort of combination of maybe an African sort of vibe and also a Scandinavian vibe. One of the Scandinavian instruments uh, that I was interested in is called a cantel, and it's a uh, dulcimer, hammer dulcimer-like instrument. So I have a Cantel sample here. A lot of these samples are going to get replaced by, by real instruments. Um, and the auto harp was another one. And that's the Cantel. Cello. Um, kalimba, which is a... This is a kalimba. I'll play it in a second. It's a... It's a also known as a thumb piano. You, it has these little tines that you pluck with your... And then it has these little um, holes that allow you to give it sort of a vibrato. And that's a traditional African instrument. Uh, and so here you have the flute. It was really spare. It seemed like a lonely scene. That's sort of the whole ensemble, and you hear um, violin, you hear... Um, that's a Kora sample, which is a... So this is sort of a combination of the African sound, and, uh, and then we have kind of a European uh, fiddle. So that's, that's, you know, that's sort of the first pass. It may be really different, you know, when we're finally done. Uh, composing for games, you know, it's a little cliche, but it's different from other media because when you write music for film, no one is, you aren't, you aren't building the theater and redesigning the, the, the uh, projector every time. Uh, with games, you pretty much are. You're at least redesigning the projector. It helps to be involved in the actual technical aspect of things, not just throwing the, the music over the wall and hoping that it gets put in okay and then checking it out later. I mean, that's a great way to do things, and sometimes it's kind of what we have to do because we're all, you know, under the schedule pressure and so on. But, but sometimes it's nice to be able to actually get your, roll up your sleeves, get your hands into the game, really see firsthand. Um, what's not working about it, make a change, and then five minutes later, you know, there it is, the way you want to hear it. Um. And let me just see if I, can, if I can actually get a signal into the system here. I really have no idea what I'm going to do, actually, to be honest with you, but I'm going to try playing some violin into it.
And then I'm just gonna look at a couple of other sounds I might use and see if I can make sort of a, a little bit of a score here. Okay, so that's a good place to start. Those little sounds you hear in the background are, are things I played on the violin already. I have a little bit of a synthesizer bed now, and I'm, I'm going to play. Um, I'm going to play some violin to it. I'm, I'm not playing to a click, so this is just sort of a free, free uh, ambient thing. My uh, prime time is broken. Oh, nice. I think it's not broken. And uh, looks like I'm quite sure why we're not. Oh. So I've set up a sample and hold loop by plucking the violin. It's going through this. Uh, old Lexicon Prime Time, which, I've, which is now sampling and holding that sound and making a repeating echo out of it. And I sort of like this kind of heartbeat thing that's going on. And, it's, um, and I've pitched it down by an octave by messing with the... This was the original sound. So I'm just going to record that. I don't know if that's what we'll use for that scene, but it might be something like that. It's a huge score. Um, there are three of us working on it. So we'll be taking my uh, Pro Tools files with the MIDI information in them, revoice with different synth sounds, do different remixes. Uh, and this is something that we're evolving, you know, we're working on it right now, exactly how it's working. So it's, you know, it's definitely paving new ground. You know, one, one thing about uh, working hard at music is, is uh, your head does get cluttered a lot with all the parameters and, and the deadlines and, you know, am I going to do it this way or am I going to do it that way? And when am I ever going to get rid of that awful synth sound I'm using? And all that kind of stuff, it just kind of melts away when you, when you come up here and get a little perspective on things. I think in some sense uh, music is an imitation of nature or the world around us and um, I just really like to, to be here whenever I can make it up the hill. It is a little reminiscent of the field that the girl starts out in now, isn't it? When I did that theme, um, we hadn't moved yet, uh, so I sort of had to imagine that field and work to the picture. Um, but you know, uh, the idea of, a, of a, a beautiful field with solitude that you can go to to just get away from everything and with a little village below is, is definitely, uh, you know, definitely resonates. So maybe I, now that we're moving back to the girls' world, maybe it's time for me to take more of these walks. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> Woo! Yeah. Full functionality. Ship it. All right. I think I say ship it at the end of every week. Just really want to ship it. Ship it. Anything else? No? Okay. Thanks, everybody. That was the most funny thing about him. Is he get, he's, I've never seen anywhere and get madder at computers than people are just, God fucking damn it. Like he just gets so, because nothing else about his personality is like that way, ragey. But when like a mission, when a computer won't do something, he gets so mad. It's always fun to see him. Oh man, I was hoping you'd capture that.